Welcome to AESHA's IAS Institute. This is a website AESHA.com. Here we upload current affairs daily and also monthly compilations are uploaded here. You can download the PDF for the months. Presently in this video we are discussing July 2016. So the July current affairs you can download the full news PDF up here. So in the first video we have already discussed till Polity. So this polity section till the CAG reports we have already discussed. The last thing we discussed is how INS Vikramaditya is presently the only aircraft carrier in service in the Indian Navy presently. So INS Vikramaditya was formerly known as Admiral Gorshkov. So it, was, it is a former USSR. So it, it we have procured it from Russia now. So it is being brought inducted into services. So this was the news there. So INS Virat, INS Vikrant have been decommissioned Vikrant in 2010 and Virat now in 2016 they have been decommissioned. So these were aircraft carriers so ships which can carry aircraft so they can land aircrafts can take off and land on these ships they have those capabilities. The next section which we start with in this video is on corruption. So this first news is regarding the Lokpal amendment which is will compulsory disclosure of assets tackle corruption. So the Lokpal amendment which is there, it is doing away with the mandatory disclosure of assets by July to 31. So this was the deadline which was given for public servants to declare the assets. So disclosure of assets of theirs and also their spouses dependents. So this had to be done. So this deadline has been delayed for so long and now finally the Lokpal amendment is proposing to do away with this deadline. So this is there plus also another provision which is there is regarding NGOs, corporates also they have sought exemption from this provision that they, uh, they, they have to maintain their privacy. So NGOs are also supposed to disclose assets, corporates there are limitations on them when they are receiving foreign funds then they have to disclose the assets as well. So the individuals heading the NGOs. So then another point which is put forth is that United Nations Convention Against Corruption to which India is also signatory, it requires a legal framework for asset declaration of government officials. So this is a, this is a requirement under International Convention 2, UN Convention and this is a provision under our Lokpal and Lokayukta Act of 2013 but the amendment is trying to dilute it. So this is the compulsory disclosure of assets by government employees. It's, it is argued that it is not a violation of individual privacy because there is a direct link between income, salary and the assets declared. So if there is any discrepancy means there is corruption involved. So disclosure of assets should not take place, privacy should be upheld is a false argument. So that is being pointed out. So it says Lokpal Act was just a halfway house. It called for mandatory declaration of assets by public servants but provided no legal structure for verification of those claims. So that is not there. Plus even the declaration of assets is now being diluted in the amendment. So central government employees on the other hand anyway have to declare their assets as per the service rules. And their claims there are actually verified annually by central vigilance officers. So this provision is there already for central government employees is highlighted. So this is regarding Lokpal and Lokayukta Act, we have discussed it quite often. It was eight times that attempts were made to pass this act. Finally in 2013, this act was passed. So it calls for having a Lokpal appointed. So it is a body comprising of eight members, the chairperson and eight members. So these out of these eight, four are from judicial side and four from non-judicial side. Till date, since the pact has been passed in 2013, the Lokpal has not been appointed because for the appointment of Lokpal, there is a selection committee, high powered selection committee, which is comprising of the prime minister, home minister, and one of the requirements, even the Lok Sabha speaker, you can see the Supreme Court judge, but one of the requirements is that the leader of the opposition of the house is also required of Lok Sabha. So this leader of the opposition in Lok Sabha presently is not there. Because as per the norms, the, idea, the definition of leader of the opposition is that they should, they should that party should have at least 10% of the seats in the house. But then there is no other party after a, a post BJP who is in power, no other party which has at least 10% of the seats. So there is a single largest opposition as such which is Congress but it does not have 10% of the seats. So this is the point on which the present government is saying that since this 
selection committee cannot be formed that is why lokpal cannot be appointed so we are planning to amend the lokpal and lok ayukta act the amendment bill should be passed only then lokpal can be appointed so this provision is also there in the lokpal amendment act apart from the other provisions which we just spoke of the diluting that the asset declaration deadline is also been shifted so this leader of the opposition here in lok sabha will be replaced by single largest opposition party in lok sabha so that nomenclature change would also take place apart from this lokpal selection committee there is before that a lokpal search committee appointed to so that committee's work comes before the selection committee's work so that search committee brings out names which are suggested to the lokpal selection committee so this is the whole process and then the actual lokpal comprising of chairperson and eight members is appointed then next news item so these are regarding the changes which we were talking of so ngos with 10 lakh and above donation in a year they come under the ambit of lokpal under the lokpal provisions and even if the annual income is of 1 crore or above of private entities and they are funded by a government as such they also come under the lokpal ambit so this is the provision as such ngos getting foreign aid also are under the lokpal act so there is a criteria there to 10 lakh and above foreign aid means they come under lokpal the next section is interstate waters so this is regarding mahadai water dispute so mahadai is a river and the dispute is between two states Karnataka and Goa. So this a tribunal has also been established. It's headed by J N Panchar. So Karnataka's petition presently was rejected. This particular news is not important, but this fact is important. Also, another fact is about T M C F T. So generally, this release of water which is demanded is the unit used is T M C F T. So this stands for thousand million cubic feet. So thousand million means one billion. One billion means ten raised to nine. So this means in lakhs when we talk of one million is actually ten lakh. So this is roughly two thousand eight hundred crore liters of water it's shown. So this is there. The next interstate water dispute mentioned here is Pala River water dispute. So this Pala River is also there are three riparian states on this. So again Karnataka here to Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. So Andhra Pradesh before bifurcation. So if you consider with bifurcation, then it comes four states. So Pala River, it originates in Karnataka, flows through Tamil Nadu, and also drains into Bay of Bengal. Its area also river flows in Andhra Pradesh, but to some extent, 33 kilometer flow is also there in Andhra Pradesh. So Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, with Telangana also. So this is a 124 year old agreement between the state of Madras and Mysore. So Madras presently is Tamil Nadu, and Mysore Karnataka. So on sharing of Pala River, this was already there. So Tamil Nadu government has now approached the Supreme Court calling for permanent injunction because the newly bifurcated state of Andhra Pradesh now is thinking of building check dams and diverging diversion structures to draw drinking water and this will result in parchment in the area of Tamil Nadu. So this dispute has arisen now because of steps taken by Andhra. So this is mentioned here. so it it calls for compliance of the 1892 water sharing pact so this was between madras and mysore then next is india abstains at un vote on lgbt independent expert so this it was a un voting so india avoided taking any position and the reason given for abstaining because it was for the rights of lgbt community lesbian gay bisexual and transsexual persons so it neither voted in favor nor against the abstaining it said was done because this case is pending before the supreme court in the country presently and it cannot pronounce anything on the issue while it is before the judiciary so this was the statement given by the government so some states opposed it to like the islamic states and also russia it was opposed and countries like india south africa philippines they abstained as well so some many countries which opposed they called it that cultural traditions did not support such move that's why they were opposing it the next is prime minister narendra modi has asked all states to put in place a 14 point charter to tap the potential of the youth so this is for their increased participation in national schemes so he calls for this youth organization such as Uh, nss scouts guides indian red cross society so this all has to be uh, strengthened now 
also during 2017 fifa under 17 world cup will be held in india so sports being highlighted is the case here too. so fifa under 17 which is for football so it will be held in india then next is india's widening gender gap a concern says ilo so this is regarding international labor organization it says there is a difference of 25% in workforce participation rate of men and women in general worldwide but in india it is up to 40 percent so this has been put forth by ilo then next is woman and child development minister announced that women being harassed on twitter can reach out to her on the hashtag i am trolled help then regarding dalits the news is that seven members of dalit community in gujarat attempted suicide protesting against atrocities on them so they have been Trashed, brutally assaulted in Una, Gujarat in July 2016 here. So this was the time then. So they were thrashed because they were skinning a dead cow. So this was the incident which had snowballed into a major political issue. So this is regarding that. Then Una rocks parliament too. So this is there. So this again regarding Gauraksha. Then next is funds meant for SCs underutilized. Fines panel. So the National Commission for Scheduled Castes here has found that funds which are meant for SCs, they are underutilized. So there is a scheduled caste sub plan and funds are allocated for this. But then the actual expenditure as such taking place is not on par because it says that in many states what is happening is this scheduled caste sub plan outlay is adjusted in general population schemes. So under the schemes which are for general population, how much of SC? population specific how much expenditure has been done is calculated so as national commission for schedule caste actually wants that there should be schedule caste specific schemes which should be there under for utilization of these funds so this is the point put forth the next is world health organization report sounds alarm on doctors in india so this is regarding the Doctors as such, allopathic doctors in India, there are only 31% of those who claimed so that they were educated up to senior secondary school level. And 57% did not have medical qualifications and they were practicing as doctors. So many of these would also be called quacks. So quacks are these who don't have, med those who don't have registered medical qualification and still in rural areas, remote areas, they practice allopathic medicine. So they are called quacks. Then next is government to announce recapitalization of public sector bank. So this has already been announced under the Indra Dhanush scheme. The seven points which were put forth for banks as such. So on the recapitalization, government is to recapitalize public sector banks providing 25,000 crore capital infusion in the financial years 2015-16 and 16-17. And then every in the next two years as such, it will be 10,000 10, crores each. So this is being put forth here. It says public sector banks account for around 70% of the total banking system assets in the country. So presently it's mentioned here you can see 25, 25 and then 10, 10. So this was under the Indra Dhanush scheme. So government has also said that its ultimate aim is to lower the number of large public sector banks. So presently there are around 27 public sector banks. It wants to consolidate them and to bring them down to 8 to 10. And also it is, it may, it's saying it's not averse to means it may reduce the stake of the government in these banks also up to 52%. So it's bringing down its stake also. That is the main goal. Then this is 75% of the amount collected for each bank is now released, is being released now to provide liquidity support. So remaining will be released later and it will be linked to performance. So the amount which has been allocated 25,000 crore. So this amount will be gradually, recapitalization will be gradually released. So and it will be linked to performance is highlighted. Then this is India's growth may be overstated. So it says that there is 100% FDI approved as such in civil aviation, defense, certain sectors of e-commerce and pharmaceutical sector too. So the government also, also eased requirements from retail, for some retailers to source state-of-the-art technology in India too. So relaxation for these state-of-the-art technologies was also done by the government. So these points are highlighted. And another point is there regarding FDI in airlines. So experts have described a contradictory and confusing provision in the 
Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, uh, not circular. So it says that substantial ownership and effective control, SOEC of airlines should vest with Indian nationals. So FDI in aviation is 100%. Airlines FDI is 100%. So if 100% FDI is allowed, then how substantial ownership and effective control question comes? Because foreign investment is allowed completely. But this is a caveat along with this FDI that substantial ownership and effective control of the airlines should remain with Indian nationals. So means 51%, more than 50% should be with Indian nationals. So this is the point. Then other conditions of the civil aviation sector in the FDI policy. It says that it clearly mentions that an air operator permit will be granted to a company only if it is registered in India. So, this is regarding Indian national and the chairman and two-third of its directors are Indian citizens and substantial ownership and effective control is vested in Indian nationals. So, these also caveats are there. Then next is India Post Philately Company. This will be set up as a public limited company fully owned by the government. So, this is being proposed. Then Brexit to have neutral impact on Indian financial markets. So exports to UK and the rest of EU count for 0.4% and 1.7% of India's GDP respectively. So exports to UK is less when compared to overall EU. So this is there but of course EU, UK plays a major role as such for the country. However, it says that the effect on the Indian economy which we are seeing, immediate effect that the economy is not doing well, that is majorly because of global demand which is not uh, no, at its peak, it's a lackluster global demand as it says. So, this is constraining exports from India, one thing. And second is the drought condition. Two years of drought as such has dampened the consumption within the country too. So, weak rural incomes means higher food inflations to purchasing power goes low. So, this is affecting the economy. And third point which it says is that some large corporates have, with high leverage as such for some large corporates weighs on credit demand. So, the assets in the banking system are negatively affecting credit supply because of some large corporate NPAs. So, this NPA issue is the third point highlighted because of which the effect on the economy presently is damp. So, this is there. The next is India software as a service market may grow to 1 billion dollars. So, software as a service market in India has tripled as such. So, it is expected to triple as such by 2020. So, software as a service means pay as you go software distribution model. So, this is rather than companies building their software on their own in their company inbuilt, it can source it. So, software as a service from another service provider. So, they don't have in-house facility for this, but they are sourcing it. So, for healthcare, e-commerce, education, there are software as a service adoption which is very popular. So, US and EU account for 80% of the demand for Indian SAS solutions. So, this is a point put forth. Like you must have heard of ERPs, etc. So, these enterprise resource management software, planning software. So, all these are SAS. Then next is, Kane slabs dollar 5.6 billion claim on government for loss of value. So, this is regarding Can Energy. So, this is British oil and gas explorer which had invested in India. So, Can India was a company established here too in which it had investment is transferred its shares here and then Can India's shares were also transferred to Vedanta Group. So, here are these transfers which have taken place on this government of India is demanding taxation that these shares being sold off are actually resulted in, resulting in capital gains. So, capital gains tax should be there and that demand which has been made that has also been done by retrospectively amending the taxation laws. So, this retrospective tax demand is also a controversy and Can Energy says rather its investment should be protected under the UK India bilateral investment treaty. So, this it says that it failed to uphold its obligations in India and it did not provide fair and equitable treatment to Cane Energy. And that is why Cane Energy has now gone for international arbitration. So, it has dragged India to the international courts of law demanding compensation. And it is not ready to pay the tax and even the interest which has been demanded from them by the IT department in India. So, this is the gist of the whole story. Then next is 
Politics stretches list of smart cities from 100 to 109. So earlier it was decided there would be 100 smart cities which will be decided by the competition. So now the government has increased it to 109. So these will be the cities which should be developed, smart cities developed in the next 5 years. So 9 more have been allowed. Then the list you can see there is these are the names of the latest entrants as such. But then the, a question as such may May, will be least likely because UPSC does not ask you to remember all the names of all the cities. You don't have to go through 109 cities. So this is their funding. How would it be done is mentioned here. So the smart cities you can see it will be government of India providing funding to public private partnership is being pushed for. Municipal bonds can also be issued and borrowings from multilateral organizations is also allowed for smart city development apart from user charges too. Then next is India gets $1 billion loan from World Bank for solar mission. So World Bank is supporting India's solar program. So solar rooftop technology infrastructure for solar parks, even solar and hybrid technologies are being supported by World Bank. So this you can see for rooftop solar program etc. So India is planning to triple its share of renewable energy by 2030. So this is the target which we have set. And another initiative which India has taken is about International Solar Alliance. So this has been proposed by India. So World Bank Group President has also signed an agreement to be the financial partner in this International Solar Alliance. So this aims to increase solar energy use around the world with the goal of mobilizing at least $1 trillion in investment by 2030. It consists of presently 121 countries in International Solar Alliance and the leader here is India, the proposer. Then World Bank support is also there for Smart Cities program, Ganga Rejuvenation program, Skill Development, Swaj Bharat, Power for All. So World Bank does support us through its funding. Then another is the index of logistics. So this has been released by World Bank recently. So, from 2014 to 2016, India's rank has gone up so from 54 to 34. So, logistics means movements or movements of goods, etc. take place. The next is Kudankulam plant reaches milestone. So, the second reactor at Kudankulam nuclear power plant project, which is supported by Russia in Tamil Nadu. So, this has second reactor has also attained criticality. First reactor had attained criticality. It has been connected to the southern grid too. It's applying electricity to various states here. So now second reactor has also attained criticality. The question is what does this term mean? Attaining criticality. So the thing is that in a reactor what we need is a controlled sustained fission reaction. So it's a chain reaction but it should be controlled. So that controlled sustained fission reaction would take place when the fuel rods inside the nuclear reactor are producing and losing a constant number of neutrons. So in the fuel, the fuel which is provided, the bombardment which takes place in nuclear fission reaction that happens through the neutrons. And in the reaction too, neutrons are produced. So these neutrons are used for further bombardments. So if these neutron numbers are not controlled, then it would become an uncontrolled fission reaction which is the genesis of a nuclear bomb, atom bomb. So this criticality as such is very important. So the second reactor has now attained this criticality. It is producing and losing a constant number of neutrons. So this is that means nuclear energy stable system is stable. So you can see the other uh, once the reactor starts generating power then within 45 days from criticality it will be connected to the grid also like the first reactor. So it's a VVR reactor constructed with Russian technical assistance. Another thing which you should know is that light water is used as a coolant in this reactor. Enriched uranium fuel assemblies are there. So that is the fuel uranium and coolant is light water and even the moderator is light water. You can see it took 11 years for this project to be uh, to attain criticality. We the first reactor attained criticality in 2013 after 11 years of it being proposed. So the problem was in, in the protests also. So people were protesting against this in these regions. So now finally it had the delay is there was delay in supply of components also. So all these have been eased out and the first reactor as we said has a 10 criticality synchronized with southern grid 2 in 2013 and power has been produced which has been made available to Tamil Nadu 
केरला कर्नाटक आंध्र प्रदेश पुदुचेरी सो दिस इज रिगार्डिंग कुदनपुर एंड थर्ड फोर्थ रिएक्टर्स आर आल्सो बीइंग कंस्ट्रक्टेड नाउ दिस इज रिगार्डिंग द न्यूक्लियर रिएक्टर सो यू कैन सी न्यूक्लियर फ्यूजन टेक्स प्लेस इन द कोर द मॉडरेटर दिस रिड्यूसेस द स्पीड ऑफ फास्ट मूविंग न्यूट्रॉन सो दिस इज देयर सो लाइट वाटर हेवी वाटर और ग्रेफाइट कैन बी यूज्ड एज अ मॉडरेटर सो दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट कंट्रोलिंग न्यूट्रॉन्स this is shown here again so principal part of a nuclear reactor there are control rods so these control rods limit the number of fuel atoms that can split so this is their control rods coolant so this is the intense heat generated that needs to be cool so what is generally used as a coolant also sometimes liquid sodium is used as a coolant so what present kudankulam it is water light water then fuel fuel used is uranium 235 and radiation shield to protect the people working from radiation and radiation fragments steps are being taken you can see control rod so in control rod they control the rate of reaction by moving in and out of the reactor so these rods when they move in the rate of reaction increases and decreases means they are controlling the reaction and when they moved out means rate of reaction increases so this is the so these control rods are also made of boron and cad or cadmium so they absorb neutrons so that's how they control the reaction absorbing neutrons so the two metal the two components which are used it can be boron or cadmium with which control rods are made the next is many don't have power in power surplus india so the central electricity authority it has provided its report in which it is saying that India is energy surplus. So this energy surplus, power surplus, is so because in calculation of power demand, only people who are connected to the grid are included. So those are factored in. So that is why they, those who don't have access to electricity, they are not taken into consideration only. So of course, in statistical sense, it may be power surplus, but there is the real demand as such, encompassing all the citizens of the country. This is not coming forth. So that is what india wants to achieve power for all so government is working towards it so we do have power cuts too so though we have a power surplus then why do power cuts take place this is a question raised so it says that state discoms are unable to buy electricity due to fine poor financial health so there there is unused power lying in the grid but they don't have the capability to buy it so this is put put that state discoms they are also in losses So they are suffering. For them, a scheme has also been launched by the government. So this is Ujjwal Discom Assurance Yojana, Uday Scheme. So this was launched in November 2015. So this will help in operational and financial turnaround of discoms. So this will provide reliable, adequate, and sufficient power supply to consumers today. So when um, discoms functioning is strengthened, they they are financially strengthened. So this will be the consequence. So this is regarding the per capita power consumption in India, which is much much less than world average. It is one third actually, approximately. So this is regarding Ujjwal scheme, which you should know about. The next is AP said to be country's nuclear power hub. So in Andhra Pradesh, many nuclear power reactors would be established. One is Westinghouse, the U.S. company's nuclear power project. Westinghouse, right now we know it has already gone bankrupt. so still whether we go ahead with this nuclear power plant which westinghouse is proposing is still not finalized so the deal has not been finalized yet so westinghouse was facing troubles in gujarat where in nithi vidhi it was actually proposed so now it is planning to shift to andhra pradesh andhra pradesh is also already in the process of having six reactors coming in phases from russia and rosetta so russia is already there and now westinghouse is also planning to go there So this Westinghouse reactor, it's a Toshiba Westinghouse AP one thousand reactor. So it will generate one thousand one hundred megawatts of electricity individually. There will be six such set up. So you can see, in addition, Tata, Adani, and SR they are the largest power producers in the state. So they they were never comfortable with another giant coming in and being set up in the state. So this is regarding Gujarat. So in Gujarat now, Westinghouse is going out. to andhra pradesh then another point put forth is that us company g itachi it has also located a site in kovada andhra pradesh where it will set up its nuclear plant so even g itachi is 
having its foothold in India now, in Kovada in Andhra Pradesh. So, this is there. Then, even the six VVR Russian nuclear reactors of 1000 megawatts, they have been proposed in Haripur in West Bengal too. So, here also protests are taking place and it is expected that this would also be shifted to Andhra Pradesh. So, already it has USG Hitachi's plants in Kavada Andhra Pradesh plus even Russian VVR reactors would come to Kavada Andhra to Andhra Pradesh as such and also the third one which is there is regarding the Westinghouse. So, Westinghouse case of US company too because it is facing protests in now in Gujarat. So, that is why Mithivirtis it may also come to Andhra Pradesh. So, this is there. The next is environment. So, first on biodiversity it says India's thriving biodiversity 445 new species added in 2015. So, the prominent species we should know about them. So, one is rock gecko which is found in Chhattisgarh. Then another regarding the, then in plant species, these are new species of ginger which have been found in South Garo Hills in Meghalaya. So, these are the prominent ones you should remember. And it is said that the most discoveries were made in Eastern Himalayan region in this last year. So, Eastern Himalayas is a biodiversity hotspot. Then comes Western Ghats and then Andaman and Nicobar Islands where many discoveries of new species have taken place. The next is India home to 12% of world's bird species. So, a checklist of Indian birds has been prepared and this it shows that India has 12% of the total number of bird species in the world. Prominent ones are Himalayan forest thrush. So, this is the newest species discovered in, as such. So, this is named here. Then next is rare flower draws 100. So, this is said to be the largest flower in the world and it smells like rotting flesh. It is called Titan Arum. So, it's another name is given is Cops Flower. So, it is 2 meters tall and is the largest unbranched inflorescence in the world. And it blooms for once in 9 years as such. So, this is native plant to Indonesia as such. And the seeded plant actually, the seed planted about 9 years ago finally grows and blooms. The flower as such lasts only for 48 hours then it collapses in on itself. So, this is the largest unbranched inflorescence in the world once in 9 years. The next is scientists on a mission to save an endangered aquatic plant. So, this endangered aquatic plant is Crinum mala barassia. So, this is locally known as Kathanga. So, Kathanga is actually a plant facing extinction in its known habitat in Kerala, Kasurgo district in Kerala. So, their population has gone down drastically and it is also mentioned in IUCN red list of species. So, this is critically endangered species, Crinum malabagricum. So, this is mentioned. Then next is explore the ocean from the comfort of your home. So, this is the ocean biographic information system which has been developed. So, an open digital repository of marine biodiversity data is there. So, India is also partner in this global alliance for developing this database. Then next on pollution one is almost 30 percent of our land undergoing degradation. So, agricultural land there is a degradation taking place. India has already committed itself to UN convention on combating desertification. So, it has said that it would stop land degradation by 2030. So, this desertification actually means that the degeneration which takes place in a particular region without any scope for reversing it in one lifetime, that is in around 60 years. So, that is called desertification. So, it is the main culprit which is said for such situation of uh, you know, drought like conditions and degradation of land, it says is because of water erosion, degrading vege vegetation which is sown and land or soil erosion due to weeds. So, this three points are put. The next is banned diesel vehicles in two phases, says NGT. So, National Green Tribunal has now ordered re-registration of diesel vehicles in two phases. Only older than 15 year olds will be phased out first. So, this is the National Green Tribunal order. The next is center lets microbeads off the hook. So, microbeads these are small pellets of plastic which are extensively used in various products like shampoo, baby lotion, face creams etc. 
so but they are considered toxic harmful poison for marine life so they have been banned internationally too but then there are no studies which are showing a certainty that this can help in reducing potential toxicity so that is there so national green tribunal bench has asked the ministry of health and water resources to file their responses to so you can see us has already promulgated a ban so this starts from july 2017 so it's on cosmetic products containing microbes so that's not allowed in usa even unep united nations environment program has you know it says that it is funding investigation of the possible harm by microbes or microplastics so that is regarding the second part in the third part we'll see snt and bilateral international relations majorly thank you